Hi, I'm Mary from the Maryland Room, and this is the Frederick County Public Library's Genealogy Moment. As we enter into the new year, I thought this would be a good time to step back and give some thought to some of the concepts, the basic methodology, and the general source types that we've talked about over the last nearly 40 weeks. We're also going to get some spoilers about some topics for some upcoming genealogy moments. And I thought the best way to do this, the best way to revisit many of these things, is by spending time here in the Maryland Room once again. And we are here with our ACORN collection. Okay, now everybody hold on. Um, we're going to move, do a little bit of movement right here. On um, the ACORN collection, which is our ready reference collection, consists of six different shelves here in the Maryland Room, just to give you a view for all the different books that we have here. It's about 80 odd books. And again, it is what we call our ACORN collection. It is our ready reference collection. In librarian speak, a ready reference collection is a group of items that you use with some regularity, something that you need to have always ready, that you need to be able to go to quickly in order to help people with their information needs. This is our core genealogy collection. It is those materials that we use nearly every day, that we use for our patrons when patrons are able to come into the building, and also that we ourselves use during this time when patrons are not able to come into the building, but we're still helping to meet people's information needs. This is where we go to answer an awful lot of our genealogy questions relating to Frederick County, and the best place to start for those questions relating to Frederick County genealogy, and also to some history as well. As we've talked about, genealogy and history are closely entwined. They are kissing cousins. You can't really do, well, actually they're more than kissing cousins, they're very closely entwined. You really can't do good genealogy without touching upon history. And there's many types of social and cultural history, many types of local history that you cannot do without also touching upon genealogy topics. So these are those materials that we use regularly, nearly every day. It's an odd day when we don't pull something from the from the acorn collection and we call it our acorn collection my co-worker came up with that title um, because it is from acorns that we grow our family tree isn't that cute and every book in our collection you will find an acorn on the spine so that we know where it came from we know that it's part of the acorn collection so again about 81 titles um we do add materials to our collection it's a big deal for us when we decided this must go into the acorn collection it gives it another special kind of cachet it has reached a level where it has become such an important source for us that we need to have it at the ready at the ready so those are what ready reference collections are again those things that librarians need to access very quickly um, it allows us to know immediately where to go it also helps our patrons when they are able to come into the Maryland room to come in and this is a good browsing area if they're doing Frederick County genealogy you know we are the Maryland room so we collect for the entire state we collect all aspects of Maryland history and culture particularly Frederick County but this is the core starting point for anyone doing Frederick County genealogy, which is why I thought it was a good place to revisit, or to visit, we never visited before, but to revisit those source types and those concepts that we have talked about in order to move forward and also to get some ideas for future for future topics. Um, anything I say here today, as with all the genealogy moments, um, while I may be talking often about Maryland or Frederick County or Western Maryland specific, these are the sorts of things that you can look for any place in the world, well, particularly in the country. When you go to different parts of the world, their sources are a little different. But if I talk about a particular source type here, you can go looking for it in Boise or Poughkeepsie. You know, that's the sort of things you're going to look for anywhere in the country to help you do your genealogy. So again, we have 81 titles, 81 bound volumes, give or take, um, and they are broken into several different types of sources. Um, the first I'd like to talk about today, which are those things we've talked about over and over again, are genealogical sources. Those are those indexes and abstracts and transcriptions that I go over and over and over and over. It is often the first way that we gain access to the primary sources that we're looking for. And we're doing genealogy, doing American genealogy. Obviously, the census is always a good starting point. Um, it is kind of the starting point if you have people who were in the country during the time that the census was open. And again, our most recent open census is 1940, 1950 will be opened um, in about two years, which would be very, very exciting. So we look for the census and then for vital records. So that would be marriages, churches, and wills. Um, as we've talked about before, in Maryland, we really don't have marriage certificates. We have marriage certificates, but we don't have death certificates and birth certificates until you get into the 20th century. So we have to use what we call surrogates, and that's often going to be church records. And we have a lot of church records here in um, 
in the acorn collection. So again, perhaps the first things we would look for would be census. And while we usually access the census today through products such as Ancestry, Family Search, or um, Heritage Quest, there are occasionally indexes and abstracts and transcriptions of a particular census that are particularly important. This is Bridge in Time, which is the transcription to the 1850 Frederick Census, Frederick County Census, and of course the 1850 Census is the first census where everyone is named by name. Really, really important. This consists of not only the population schedule, but also the slave schedule, the agricultural schedule, and the manufacturing schedule. So that's why it got to be a part of the ACORN collection. It's a really, really important work and excellent transcription, and a quick way to access the 1850 census, which is so important, again, because it is the um, that time that really divides the earlier census of the later census of where everyone is named by name. And then marriages. Marriages are so important. They are really the only type of vital record we have going back, you know, much, much earlier, almost at the beginning of, this, of the state. Um, and there's different ways to gain access to marriages. Uh, we have two major sets. One is Maryland marriages. This is done by a gentleman named uh, Robert Barnes, and he did these indexes and abstracts and transcriptions coming out of church records that were at Maryland Historical. We also have a, a set of Frederick marriages that were done by Margaret Myers that come out of the courthouse. So marriages are a really particularly good starting point when you're looking for vital records, even though we say we're going to look for someone's most recent life event, and for most of these people it's their death, and go backwards. But the marriages is often the only way you can find a, a woman's maiden name, not, and not only her, her maiden surname, but also her first name. You know, often once she's married, she just is Mrs. Bob, and we never get back to not only her maiden name, but also even to her first name. So it's in marriage records that we will find her, her first name, her maiden name, and that also then allows us to take her line further back. Um, you know, we never just do the male line. The female line is, is just as important, but much harder to do for many reasons. And then marriage record, not marriage records, but church records of all kinds. And I said we have lots of church records here in the Acorn Collection. Um, I always go back to Reverend Weiser, who we've talked about several times. He did this excellent, excellent set. But we also have church records by, done by a woman named Pat Fogel, who did a lot of records relating to Middletown churches. And there are many. There are many church records here in the Acorn Collection because they are so important. Um, other sorts of things that will pick up death records that serve as death surrogates because before the time we don't have death certificates are, you know, a will index, an index to the wills. If we're lucky enough that someone has left a will, that will then obviously show us that um, that they did die and that it gives other information in the wills besides just confirming that when they died and where they died often, but also it gives us those family members, hopefully, if the will is really kind of beefy and will give information about particular, um, more than just saying, you know, I'm leaving everything to my eldest son, if they actually list all the children's names and then sometimes the wife's name as well when she gets um, her dower rights, those things that she is legally bound to get um, when someone dies. There's a certain amount of the, the land that she has access to for the rest of her life. So wills are very, very important. And then land records, land records. We have a lot of land records. Um, these are going to be picking up the 18th century land records, other works that have been done so far. And land records do more than just show the land. Of course, the land is important, but that is not all they show because if we can put people into time and place and leaving aside that, you know, many of us have ancestors who did not own land, but also in the land records, you can find references to other sorts of things. Um, other people may be mentioned in the land records. There may be family members mentioned in the land records. There could be relationships if someone is being sold land for very, 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 very cheaply. That may show a relationship. But also when you go back into the land record books themselves, into those ledgers, that's where you can find other things. A lot of slave sales will be found in the land ledgers. In the land ledgers, it's almost as if that was the only book they had in the courthouse. So other things get picked up. And then newspaper abstracts. Newspaper abstracts are again are really important, particularly for that pre-1850 period. Even though they're not as beefy because newspapers didn't have as much beefy information back then as they do today. But lay, um, newspaper abstracts and indexes can be really, also really, 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 really important. So of the source types that we would have here in our acorn section in our ready reference collection the sorts of things that you should look for no matter where you go again genealogical indexes and abstracts looking at the census even if you have already searched the census online see if there is another um, index abstract transcription that someone has done in that community because um, 
they could get different information for you. I mean, we can, you can get seven of us together and we'll all index it and we'll come up with different names. Vital records and vital record surrogates, so marriage records, church records, wills, um, land records, because land records have other stuff in them besides just land, and even then putting you into place and time, and the newspaper abstracts all really, really important. And then also we do have here in the Acorn Collection, periodicals, essentially genealogy magazines. We have Western Maryland genealogy, and then we have an index to the Maryland Genealogical Society Bulletin. These, Western Maryland genealogy, Maryland Genealogical Society Bulletin, are another way to get into indexes and abstracts and transcriptions. And another genealogy, moment, we're gonna talk about um, a major database, a major, um, national database that will help index, help gain access to these sorts of materials. And then we just have general history books. History, history, that includes um, the turn of the century histories, those things like Sharp's History of Western Maryland and Williams History of Frederick County. They tend to be very big. They tend to be in two volumes. They are, are big, beefy, very oriented to, for most places in the country, to the white community, to the middle class community. They're very oriented towards males but it doesn't mean that they shouldn't be utilized. And even though a lot of the information in these books do, does come from the family, it doesn't mean they're not sources worth taking a look at. We've talked about how all sources are suspect, um, but you just need to be aware of the pitfalls and why different sources were made. So these um, late 19th, early 20th century histories are very important. And then we have pictorial histories. Um, we are very blessed here in Frederick County to have a number of pictorial histories. This is the, our first one by Nancy Whitmore, um, Tim Cannon, and also Tom Gorslin um, from Frederick Magazine. And this is our earliest pictorial history. And again, you wanna look at histories of the community, not only to look for images of your family, but also you never know what you're gonna find. It'll show the neighborhood in which they lived. It can show um, the homes. It can give you more context as well. And also dissertations. We have a number of dissertations here. Uh, in Crime and punishment in Frederick County my favorite not only if you even if you don't care about crime and punishment in frederick county this has an excellent introduction and then there is where did it go really important and I, it's right right here it is this is probably one of our most important dissertations we have here in the maryland room um germans on the maryland frontier a social history of frederick county maryland um by elizabeth kessel really important and we've had this indexed as well so there is a way to get into names of it as well so again for histories those turn of the century histories pictorial histories dissertations and then we have sources that um help you to understand place so we have a reprint um, of the 1873 Titus Atlas, which can be really important. You know, again, it shows land ownership in the mid 19th century. And then we have a gazetteer, a place name index done by a former Maryland volunteer, Louis O'Donoghue. We've talked about Louis before. This can be particularly handy if you're not from around here and you need to know what a particular, like where's Braddock? Um, Where's Indian Cave? You know, he did a really excellent job pulling together all these sorts of place names that can then help you um, figure out exactly what's being referenced in other sorts of documents. Um, and then historic preservation survey. So again, for understanding place, atlases, gazetteers, place name books, historic preservation surveys. We have a nice collection here of site surveys that were done by um, the Frederick County Preservation Office particularly by a woman named Janet Davis. So if you're trying to find quick information on a particular structure that you've gone past or that you think your family owned, this is an excellent starting point. And then from here, we would then send you online to um, the Maryland Historical Trust. Also, we do have here in the Maryland room, how to do it books. We have the source, one of my favorite, how to do it books. And then also evidence explained by Elizabeth Schoen Mills. This talks about how to cite your sources. And in many ways, um, why do your genealogy if someone can't look at it again? Um, I'm a firm believer. I mean, we all have many reasons for doing our genealogy. And if you don't want to cite your things correctly, that's fine with me. But it's very, um, it's much more gratifying and it makes your genealogy much more, um, I wouldn't say important, but it leaves a groundwork for people who are going to come after you and use your genealogy if you cite things collect correctly and people could utilize it. So evidence explained is an excellent way to do that because it shows you the basic standards of how to cite um, how to cite books and documents and things from you may find online 
And if someone can redo your research, that makes your research more effective. And also, even if you can yourself redo your research five years from now, 10 years from now. And then finally, if you would like to get a list of all of the things here in our ACORN collection, please feel free to contact the Maryland Room at mdroom at fcpl.org. It will give you by title everything that we have here in the Maryland Room. And again, these are the sorts of things that you can look for anywhere where you go to do your research. Cemetery surveys, look for them everywhere. Um, other census indexes, look for them everywhere. Land record indexes, look for them everywhere. Dissertations, look for them everywhere. You also can gain access to our ACORN collection if you are someone who hangs out on WorldCat at all. It's just FCPL, Maryland Room ACORN collection of genealogical core materials. It just rolls off the tongue. Uh, we'll put this up at the end. Um, but that is a quick overview of the FCPL ACORN collection. Again, our ready reference collection and presents an overview of the many different source types that you should be looking for when you do genealogy. So Happy New Year from the Maryland Room. We hope this will be a very fruitful genealogical year for you, and we'll see you here next week. Bye-bye.